Well, you made it. You're in the house of God. So I want you to take just a minute or two and look at three or four people, look them right in the eyeball, and tell them, I love you, you're my family. <laughs> as soon as you do that, you may be seated. Some of you are cheating and you're going to six and seven and eight people already. And that is good, good, good. This is the house that Luff built. Welcome home. My name is Pastor Alan Griffin, and I'm one of the pastors here at Winston-Salem First, and I am so excited. I want y'all to know I'm ready to preach today, y'all. I'm ready to preach today. I could barely sleep last night. I've been waiting for 28 hours to yell and scream at you about this. So this is going to be fun. Grab your Bible with me. This is going to be a message right out of the story of Christ's sacrifice. John chapter 19, and we'll start at verse 16 in just a moment. I just want to get you set up with John chapter 19. And before I yell and scream, I want to do something. I want to receive our, our normal tithe and God's tithe and our offering this morning. Because at the end of our gathering, um, it's the first Sunday of the month, we get to do a missions offering at the end. We get to give to missions. And here's what I want y'all to do. Can you, can you keep a secret? Okay, here's a secret. There are some missionaries in the house today. And right now, they're in the kids' side sharing about how they're reaching people for Jesus and in a few moments, they're going to walk in the door, and they're going to try and be cute and slip in without anybody noticing. Remember when we used to do that in, in church? We think of the coming to church late. They're not late. They were ministering with the children, and they're going to come in here, and we're going to talk a little bit about what they're doing to transform the world. And I want us to demonstrate the honor befitting servants of God. So when they come in the door and they come to sit down, I want you, no matter what I'm doing, I could be in the middle of praying. I don't care. You know why? Because God says to honor those and give honor where honor is due. He already knows what my conversation is because he knows the future. So he knows my prayer. No matter what's going on, when they walk in that door, stand on your feet and go crazy for them. How about that? Can we do that? Okay. So you are going to let us know when they're coming in. When they come in, you're going to stand up. And as soon as you stand up, Heather, we, don't, don't be scared. I got you. As soon as Heather stands up, all of us are going to stand up. We're going to go crazy, okay? But right now, we're going to take your money and give it to God. My favorite thing to do is to be a blessing. And what's amazing is you are a generous and amazingly blessed church. And today, here's our opportunity to give your tithe give God's tithe in your offering. And what I love about this gift of giving is that every time we do it, God matches us and then some. I believe that 2022 is the and then some year for us. We're going to go forth in faith and victory, but God is going to add to us continually. Do you know that in the past 365 days, our church has nearly doubled in attendance? Come on, you better give God some praise for that. And it's not because of the chocolate preacher. It's Jesus. He's speaking to us. He's, he's, he's blessing us. He's communicating life to and through us. And so when you give today, you're not giving for self-gratification, but there is blessing attached to your gift. God says that he'll give, he'll bless it back unto you. Good measure, pressed down. Shaking together and running over. Now that's good. Lean over to your neighbor and say, that's good. So right now, I want you to prepare your best gift for the Lord. And on the screen, we're going to have instructions on how you can give online. Digital is awesome. And I love it because it enables me to give in an instant. And so, guys, go ahead and throw that slide up on our tithe and offering. And if you just text to that number, we will connect with you and 
get your money into the right place. We love you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. At the end of our gathering, you're going to hear a report on our wonderful missionaries and their effort to transform lives. But ushers, they're ready to present and to receive your gifts. Let me pray over this gift. Father, may your gift go beyond these doors into our city, into our county, into our community, and may lives forever be changed in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. While the offering is passing you, you can distribute those buckets. You should give the buckets to the missionaries. You, everybody knows they're rich. No? You're, you're right. They're not rich. They're rich in faith. They're rich in the blessing of being on the front line of kingdom work. They're rich in family. I love their kids. I got to hug those kids outside. I gave them a big old Uncle Al hug. It was awesome. And maybe after this service today, you can bless them. Not only in our missions offering. Maybe you'll do a Pentecostal handshake. I'm just saying. I know my wife's got $100 in her purse. We're going to put in their hand before they leave today. Mm -hmm. That's how we roll. That's why all my nieces and nephews want to come see Uncle Al. I buy their love. Not too proud. Have you ever been thirsty? I mean, really, really. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I know the world talks about thirsty like, mm-hmm, she thirsty. You know, and it's a different kind of thirst. They make, they can take any word and make it weird, right? I'm thirsty. Oh, really? Are you thirsty? Like, what is this? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about natural thirst. Have you ever been thirsty? Like, really thirsty? Like, you want some water so bad, you about to lose your mind. Have you ever been so thirsty? Come on, grown folk. Where you drank out of the hose? Y'all didn't die, huh? I see bottled water and I, I, I just smile because I remember drinking water that tastes like rubber and going, mm, mm, good. That stuff delicious. Ooh, that's that high quality rubber, you know? <laughs> I mean, I just remember drinking and when you get good, cold, fresh water, man, there's nothing like it. You know, I, I was doing some research on thirst. Did you know that thirst is interesting and can really help us understand the Bible extremely well. Like, first, first thing you need to know is that thirst is one of the first major signs that somebody's becoming dehydrated. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a question. This is just for fun. This is just, so, just to get you warmed up, okay? What is the number one place by which you lose water every day and you can become dehydrated? What is the number one place on your body that you can lose water and become dehydrated. Somebody just yell out some, some areas. Your skin. Nope, not your skin. What else? Intestines. <laughs> oh, Meredith. Will you just lay your hands on your wife right now? Hallelujah. She has a problem in her intestines. <laughs> I heard somebody yell out tears. I was like, dude, your life stinks. 
I don't know who you are, Mr. Lamentations, but your life is terrible if you lose a majority of your water through tears. Somebody, three or four people yelled it out. They said your mouth. That's true. Aspiration. Just breathing and talking, you, you lose, get this, up to two liters of water a day out of your mouth. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, think about it like this. Remember the Bible says that out of your bosom will flow rivers of living water to heal the nations? Consider this. It might mean this. Maybe. That, that means that when you speak and you talk, water is coming out of you. And the water that's coming out of you when the word of God is in it is living water. And the words that come out of you will heal nations, heal people, transform lives. Don't waste your water. Tell your neighbor, don't waste that water. Mm -hmm. Just 2% overall drop in your water level in your body. The volume of your, your blood flow decreases. And, and, and the salt and the minerals in your blood, they start to not increase, but they begin to gain density in your blood. And next thing you know, your body tries to combat the situation by adjusting blood pressure and adjusting your heart rate and, and doing all these things to try to change the situation. But it won't work for long because you need healthy hydration. Dehydration is dangerous. I mean, the, the stages of dehydration I mean, in their extreme form are outrageous. I mean, first of all comes headaches, then comes dizziness, then comes vomiting and blindness, kidney failure and death. I mean, that's rough. That's rough just from not drinking water. You know, God's given us a physical process whereby we can be informed when we're becoming dehydrated. It's called thirst. Thirst. You know what's funny? Everybody say, what? Physicians and scientists are still trying to figure out how you get thirsty. We're still trying to figure it out. We still don't fully understand the operation of the brain and how the, the, the brain uh, signals your whole body on hydration. We, we have theories on it and we have a little bit more understanding over the last 15 years and, and 18 years. But I'm going to tell you, we're still learning. So whenever somebody tells you we come from monkeys, just look at them and say, it's okay, y'all still learning? You'll figure this out? I love you. You see, there's brain cells within your lamina terminalis. It's a really cool term. It's this little section of your brain just in front of your brain stem. And, and, and this lamina terminalis can sense when the body's running low on water and whether you've had anything to drink recently. And this part of your brain communicates to the corresponding parts of your brain to let them know to tell you, you need to drink. Now, when this happens, your body's really encouraging adequate hydration. But some people use inadequate hydration. Some people seek satisfaction for their tongue instead of their body. I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people that likes the sweet tea. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. You better give God some praise for sweet tea. You know he came down from heaven and said, put that tea leaf in that water. Put the sugar in there. <laughs> and you will find a sweet treat. Glory be to the king. Cheer wine. Mm, mm, mm. That's, like, that's like the blood of North Carolina. <laughs> Coca-Cola. Pepsi-Cola. Dr. Pepper. Mm, mm, mm. Coffee. If somebody tells you God's not real, you just say one word to them. Coffee. <laughs> Mortal man did not come up with this. <laughs> Ethiopians, by the way, thank you for discovering coffee. I love you and your, your little goat that ate them, the fruits. You're just the best people on the face of the earth. Coffee. Mm. You know, no matter what we want, what our body needs is what? Water. 
Our body needs water, y'all. Water is the only thing that is more than adequate for hydrating. Water is the only thing productive to fulfill that need. And without fulfilling the need, you'll mask it with things that only bring a temporary fix, but the solution and the problem has not been combined. Water is the answer. You know, Jesus talks about thirst in one of his final statements on the cross. In John chapter 19, verse 16, the soldiers took charge of Jesus. They were about to crucify him, y'all. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Ooh, this part of the story drives me crazy. Many of the Jews saw the sign, and they saw the place where it was put. And they said to, to Pilate, don't put that up there, that he's the king of the Jews, but that he says he's the king of the Jews. And Pilate looked at him and said, shut up, fool. Wait, that's not in there. Um, that's in a ghetto international version. Pick that up in Detroit. I'm going to bring it back. Pilate said, you know what? What I've written, I have written, and it stands to this day. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. We know that this happened, that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mama, his mama's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, mama or woman, that's a, the word woman was a term of endearment and a term of honor. So let me say it the way we would say it today. Mama, here's your son. John, this is my mama. We talked about this. Take care of her. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am, I can't hear you, I am Let's try this side of the room. I am. Let's go back over here. I am. Wow. I mean, Jesus is dying for the world. I mean, Jesus is one who is not normally distracted, right? Jesus is dying for the world. He's giving his life for the world. And he looks down from the cross and he says, Mama, I have a plan for you. My John, you're going to take care of her. John, we talked about this. Take care of Mama. He's caring for his family while he's dying for the world. What a king. But before he dies, he expresses simply one expression of need. One expression of need. He says, I am thirsty. Was Jesus dehydrated? Absolutely. But what happens after this? And why did he say it? And what did Jesus want to drink? What did he want? I often imagine... Jesus' favorite drink would be lemonade. That's just my thought. He looks like a lemonade kind of guy. You know, you ever see pictures of Jesus? I can't see Jesus drinking beer. I just don't. I know they drank wine back then, but when I see Jesus in my mind, my Jesus, he's Jamaican. And when I see him, I see him sipping lemonade mine. What did Jesus want to drink? Like, what did he want? Did he want wine? Did he want water? W what did he want? I have discovered something in the scripture that I believe explains what Jesus wanted to drink. And it may not be anything you and I would have ever imagined, but it's a discovery that God wants to give you today. And I'll tell you at the end of my message. <laughs> this is fun. The Bible says, after he said, I was thirsty, this is what happened. A jar of wine vinegar was there, and they soaked a sponge in the vinegar, put, the, put it on a stalk of hyssop, and lifted it to his lips. After Jesus had drank, drunk that vinegar, or tasted that vinegar, he said, it is finished. We're going to preach about that next week. It is, we're going to shout 
Next week, the end of the service is going to be so buck wild. We're going to shout and jump and dance, and then we're going to run out of here in victory. It's going to be so much fun. I can't wait for next week. Don't you miss next week. It is finished. Mm, mm, mm. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You know, I'm sure Jesus didn't want vinegar. But Jesus did fulfill the prophecy. In Psalm 69, we hear of a prophecy I think it's 69, verse 20 and 21, a prophecy that while Jesus would sacrifice in, in agonizing death, that all that mankind would give him for comfort was bitterness and gall. The transliteration was vinegar for his thirst and poison in his food. That we gave him no comfort on that cross. That when Jesus died for humanity, so that we could be forgiven of all of our sins, that he paid the ultimate price and there was no comfort in it. He suffered and endured every moment. He took all the pain. He took all the blame. He took all the shame. He took the hatred of his name. He took it all to the cross. Why? Just for me and just for you. So that we could be in a relationship with the Father, an ultimate sacrifice had to be paid. And Jesus, the very Son of God, was willing to give it. Think about it like this. He fulfilled the prophecy on the cross. Do you know what that tells me about my pain? Do you know what that tells me about your hurt? Do you know what that tells me about your infirmity, your injury, your problem? It tells me this, that no matter how bad it gets, God still has a plan. The prophecy was fulfilled. In other words, the plan was fulfilled. God didn't miss anything. And no matter what you might be facing right now, God isn't missing anything. His plan will prevail. He will bring victory to you. Many are the plans in a woman's heart. Many are the plans in a man's heart. But it's God's purpose that will prevail. He will prevail for you. For you. For our God is for you. He's for you, not against you. You're his boothang. Can you say that in church? That's what I say about my lady. I give her nicknames. First nickname I ever gave her was Pookie. She's my Pookie. And lately I've been like, that's my boothang. Yeah. Hey, boo. I'm going to kiss you after church. Mm-hmm. Yes. And back to the word of God. I know what Jesus wanted to drink, and I can tell you in two stories, and then we're going to do something really fun together. We're going to demonstrate it together. You ready? First story is Paul. The Bible talks about Paul, the apostle, and towards the end of his life, he would ultimately die in Rome a martyr for the cause of Christ. But not long before he died, he wrote to one of his greatest spiritual sons, one of his mentees, if you will. His name was Timothy. I like saying it like that. He wrote to Timothy. And here's what he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. He says, For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He said, But I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there's laid up for me a crown which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall award me on that day, but not only to me, but also to all who long for his appearing. Paul wrote at the end of his life, catch this, y'all. He believed that his life was a libation offering poured onto the altar of God. And he said, I'm almost done pouring. I know my end is near, but I gave it all. I didn't save anything. See, there was something called a libation offering back in the day. And what people would do is, when they really wanted to bless God with a, with a drink, they would take their most precious and prized drink. I don't know what yours is, but you know what mine is, coffee. And, and, and I love coffee. I'm going to preach one day about coffee. Coffee will preach. Oh, you just wait. I got so many sermons. This summer, I'm preaching all my crazy stuff. So you better get ready this summer because I got messages that I've been waiting to preach my whole life that I'm preaching this summer. One of them is about coffee and how coffee teaches us about purity. 
Mm. But if I wanted to give God my best drink, I would make myself a French press of French roast coffee. And I grind it at a setting eight in my Baratza grinder. 30 ounces of beans weighed on my mini scale. That's right. I'm a nerd. I don't care. I put it in my, my press and I put boiling water, 210 degree water on those beans. While the oils and the aromatic senses are inspired and it emerges in the, the steam of glory, I wait for four minutes. Four minutes. One, you're like a dream come true. You know what I'm talking about? And I just wait. And I wait four minutes. Man, I'll be walking around the kitchen like, this is going to hurry up. This is going to hurry up. And finally, my little timer goes. And I press towards the mark. <laughs> you can see this summer is going to be fun. And then I would walk to what was called the altar where they would put sacrifices to God, and they would pour it on the altar and worship while they did it. They didn't just pour it in solemnity and solitude and quiet. They would pour it and say, hallelujah, praise and glory to the most high God who has done marvelous things. Lord, you are great and greatly to be praised. You are the highest, higher than I. There is none other like you, for you are altogether unique and different. Oh God, I worship you in spirit and in truth. And I could just see God in heaven going, that, Alan, is a delicious cup of joe. That's a libation offering. Man, we, we missed out on some fun stuff, didn't we, not being born back then? That's just cool. And, and they would offer the most valuable liquids, wine, water, anything that was precious. David did it, remember? His mighty men fought a garrison to bring him a, a, a cup of water from a cool spring. And David received it and said, I will not drink of that which cost men their lives. And he poured it on the ground because he couldn't get to the altar in time. He poured it on the ground before the Lord and worshiped the Lord. And I believe his men were so honored that what they fought for was worthy of sacrifice to God. Honor begets honor. Paul believed his life was that water. Poured into the ground. Huh. One more story. One more. Eighteen years ago, I moved to Daytona Beach, Florida. It's no longer my home. I got to fly back there last week for a couple of days, and I went, this city stinks. I'm a Winston-Salem man now. Done with that place. You know what I'm saying? That place ain't my home. It was weird. It felt immediately foreign to me. But when I moved there 18 years ago, I remember talking with my former pastor. His name was Jim Raley. And one day I'll, I want you to meet my pastor. He's one of the greatest men I've ever known. And, and he's this really amazing preacher. So super white and country. I love him. And our church is just like us. Full of black people and white people and yellow people and brown people and green people and weird people. It's so cool. Our church is so multicultural and our pastor's heart so big. But when he first came to our church there, he, he came and it was a church full of angry people. About 200 people were angry. They were ticket off at everybody. Lots of fighting going on in the church. People fighting all the time. It was rough. And, and he said the church was over a million dollars in debt. And when he went out to buy toilet paper for the church at Walmart, Walmart would not accept their checks. Because they'd been bouncing checks all over town. He said he discovered their church was in trouble. He didn't know at first, but he found out soon. And he went into his prayer closet and he said, God, you got to send some rich people to our church so they can pay these bills and we can reach the world. 
And, and this is what God said to him. He said, Jim, I want you to reach people that nobody wants, and then I'll send you people everybody wants. And so my pastor said, okay, God, I'll do whatever you want. So he said, we're going to get homeless people. We're going to bring them to church. It's going to be great. The church people are like, yay, go get them. So pastor got a van and started picking up homeless people and bringing them to church. And the church grew from 200 people to 175. <laughs> and pastor was like, man, I'm not giving up. I'm not going to quit. And, and pastor said, we're going to get another van. We're going to pick up even more people. We're going to fill in the blanks with the people who left, with people who want to be here. And so he got a second van. And that's when a man, a great man, showed up at our church. His name was Don Culver. Everybody say Don. Mm, such a good man. He came and he got excited about pastor's vision to reach people that it seemed like were rejected and forgotten in society. So he said, Pastor, I'll help you. So Don drove a van. One day Don came into pastor's office. He goes, Pastor, listen, I got an idea. Okay, listen, we're bringing people to church. It's great. They're, they don't have homes. They need, you know, what we, what we can give. We'll give them. We'll give them Jesus. He goes, but, man, they're hungry, Pastor. What if, just, what if we, we have a kitchen right here? What if we made some food and just set it out and they can eat? And then they hear the gospel and they won't be hungry. My pastor's like, that's great. He goes, who's going to cook? Don goes, well, I'll drive and I'll cook. I'll cook before I drive. I make a mean chili. I'm like, that's a horrible idea before church. <laughs> I wasn't there for that conversation. I'd have been like, no, no, no. <laughs> and he said, but I'll pick them up and we'll bring. And, and, and pastor said, go for it, Don. And next thing you know, we went from one van to two vans to three vans to a bus, then we stole another church's bus on Sundays and used it, and we were picking up people. Then Don comes to the pastor's office again. He goes, Pastor, I have another idea. I mean, bear with me. This is, this is different. He goes, our church meets in a gymnatorium. We have a kitchen in there, but we also have showers, locker rooms. Pastor, come on, man. What if we gave people showers and food? Less than a month later, he comes back. Like, like he hasn't asked for enough yet. He goes, Pastor. I have another idea. We have a fellowship hall. Um, what if just on Sunday, we turned it into the Gap? Remember the Gap store? Remember that was cool back in the day? Fall into the Gap. That was the that store was tight. It became sagebrush. Now it's city trends. Basically, same thing. He goes, we will put all these donated clothes in this room, and we'll put racks, and people can walk in the building. They can go take a shower. They can go shopping for clothes. They can eat a meal. Then they'll come to church. He goes, pastor, then nobody will know they're homeless. My pastor said, oh, brother Don, let's do it. And they got two buses and three buses and four buses. Then we got a bus for people who are differently abled in wheelchairs and all kinds of stuff. And then we started picking people up from different senior centers. And it just kept growing until now they have a full-size dream center. Church is no longer 200 people or 175. It's close to 4,000 people. And there's billionaires sitting next to homeless people, worshiping God. And nobody can tell who's who except a bunch of people smell all like Irish Spring. <laughs> and it's all because of Don. Come on, worship team. I went to Don's death. I know that's weird. It was weird for me. I'd never been to a death before. But Don had a terminal illness, and, and, and I remember, this is years ago, but I remember I was preaching in West Florida, and I heard from Don's family that Don was passing away, and I was like, uh-uh, not before I get there, and I floored it, and don't tell my wife, I floored it, baby, you don't hear this, cover your ears, I floored it, I was going so fast on them country roads, it wasn't no joke, but I got to his townhouse, this man who'd led thousands of people to Jesus, 
It was so cool because he's like a salty Christian. You ever have a salty Christian? Like mean Christians? They're my favorite. Not people that are mean to you. They're just mean. You know what I mean? Like he walk up and be like, you're ugly. I love you. I was like, dude, you're, you're kind of crazy and I like it. He was my kind of guy, you know. People that are mean aren't mean to you. They're mean to themselves. And mean people have a place here. It's mean people that when it rains, they show up to church because they're mean to themselves. It's mean people when they're sick, they still keep volunteering because they're mean to themselves. There's mean people that choose to drive the bus when the youth group goes on a trip because they hate themselves. Anybody who volunteers for any young adult, youth, children, teens, ministry, you're the Rambos of the kingdom of God, and I love you. Thank you. And Don didn't have a beautiful big house. He didn't have all the cool stuff. There weren't even any people at his house. It was just his close family. And when I pulled in my car and I got out of my car, me and my fancy little car, he had a little jacked up little Nissan. Not a nice car. And I walked to the door and I walk in and there was beautiful food laid out. You know it's getting late for that person's life when the food is beautiful and no one's touching it. And I walked in, I said, where's my brother? And his wife said he's over there in the living room. They put a hospital bed in the living room and it had like machines and some stuff, but not much. They were just trying to keep him comfortable. And I walked over and I said, hey, what's in the IV? And his wife said, oh, just some liquids. They're trying to keep him hydrated. And I thought, of course they are. Because Don has poured it all out. He's given every drop. You know, he retired six years early and lost a ton of money just so he could be more involved with serving people that were without homes. He'd sacrifice so much. And I walked to the end of the bed, and I looked at his feet. His feet were sticking out of his bed, sheets. And I went, them some ugly feet. And all gnarled up and stuff. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He always does like this. He's always fixing me, right? He goes, Alan, who's going to fill his shoes? Who's going to take his place? I said, come on, Jesus, I'll do it. Whatever you want, I'll do it. If you want me to do this, I'll stop traveling. I'll come here. I'll run the program like, like he was running. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And God goes, no, no, I want you to pray. I have something else for you, but I want you to pray for the people that will take his place. And God said, people. It took four people to replace what one person was doing. I walked to the head of the bed, and, and he was breathing shallow. I asked this lady, I said, baby, can he hear me? She says, I think so. He moves every so often. So I leaned down. I said, I'm going to need a minute because he and I have our own language. I leaned down. I went, you old salty dog, peanut eating fool. I sure love you. This is your black brother from another mother. And I kissed him on his head couple times he and I used to always joke that we were ebony and ivory and he said I was the ugly stick I'm like man you gonna make me use that ugly stick on you we just always had so much fun and it was so hard to see him like that and and I whispered something in his ear I didn't want Anyone else to hear it? Because I didn't want him to take it the wrong way, you know? Because he and I had our own language. And I said, Don, I got to tell you a story. This is weird. It's like a story in a story in a story. Kind of crazy, but bear with me. I said, Brother Don, 
our whole pastoral staff was in Miami for a conference. And while we were in Miami, I, I, I pastored in Miami for several years with a great man, a guy named Rich Wilkerson. And, and when I was there, I learned all about the city. So I know everywhere to go and everywhere not to go. And at one moment, our group of four vans was riding from the, the conference to the hotel and they made a wrong turn. I was in van two and I was getting on my phone. Remember Nextel? Y'all better stop turning down this road. You're heading to Alapata. And, and they didn't know what I was talking about. And so at, when they got to Alapata, they got off the highway and they turned around and went to a gas station. I was like, get back in the van, white people. You finna die right now. And they didn't listen to me. They start getting out, going inside to get snacks. I'm like, y'all don't understand. This is where tourists go missing. It's crazy down here. They don't even have gangs in Alapata. The gangs all got killed by the police. It's no joke in Alapata, y'all. Now it's changing now. It's shifting. You guys have been to Miami. Little Haiti is gorgeous. And in Liberty City, man, they turned that mug upside down. It's amazing. But at this point, uh-uh. It was bad. And, and while I was getting out of my van to tell everybody to get back in their vans, I'm like, hey, y'all, get back in the van. This is not a good place for you to stop. Get back in the van. I hear a dude riding by on a bike. He goes, hey. I was like, oh, shoot. I'm going to die right now. So he's walking towards my pastor, Pastor Rayleigh, and I'm like, no, you don't. You're going to kill me, but you ain't going to kill my pastor. I was like, hey, man, are you okay? What do you need, bro? Hey, I'm here. What do you need? That's my pastor. Hey, everything's all right. What do you need? He goes, Pastor Rayleigh. And I went, uh-uh. We were 200 miles from Daytona Beach where that church is. And he goes, Pastor Rayleigh, my name is Aaron, and I used to ride your bus. I was without a home, and I used to ride your bus. He said, I was strung out on drugs. He said, but you prayed for me. You fed me. You gave me showers and shaves. He goes, I got healed. I got delivered. I got a job. I just left work, and I'm going to pick up my kids, and I want you to know that I'm so grateful for what you've done for me. And my pastor sat there and went, oh, thank you, buddy. And I was sitting in the little townhouse in Ormond Beach, Florida, and I looked at Don. He couldn't look at me. And I said, Don, you did that. That was you. And I said, now listen to me closely. You have fought the good fight. You have finished the race. You have kept the faith. Now get out of here, Don. We got this, man. You did a good job. We'll see you next year. We'll see you in the next millennium. We'll see you in the twinkle of an eye. In a moment, we'll see you. I got in my car and I left. And I remember thinking, man, where's the parade? Where's the dancers? Where's the celebration? This dude just gave his life. Where's the people? And God said, oh, he has an audience. It's the great cloud of witnesses. Samson and Jephthah and Balak and, and even Saul. Man, all the great leaders throughout all time. Corey Ten Boom. <laughs> They're all there. And like these missionaries when they came in. Well done, Don. Well done. I hadn't even gotten home quite yet, and my phone lit up, and they said Don was gone. I'm so happy to tell you that Don is in a place where there's no more pain. There's no more dying. There's no more suffering. There's no more cancer. Cancer is canceled in heaven. There is no more defeat, for victory is ours. There's no more suffering for any of us. Jesus will wipe every tear from our eyes. I tell my students, there's fried chicken trees up there. There's Kool-Aid rivers and candy canes falling from the sky. It's amazing. It's a place we all want to go. Wherever Jesus is. So what was I saying to you? I was saying this. What did Jesus want to drink? You. 
He wants to drink you. The ground of this world is the altar. And we are the living sacrifice. What is 70% of your body made of anyway? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to use our body water. And we're going to give this world and we're going to give our creator something that's to totally satisfying, that's sustaining, that's hydrating. We're going to allow living water to come out of us to heal this world. We are going to use our giftings and talents and abilities. Let me explain it like this. We're going to give God our blood, our sweat, and our tears. We're not going to waste that water, y'all. What's your blood? It's your relationships. It's your family. It's your children. When you, serve, when you lead them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, you are investing into the water of their generation. Your husband, your wife, your marriage. Give it to Jesus. The more you give it to Jesus, the better it's going to get. Give your relationships to Christ. And that's your blood. Number two, your sweat. Your sweat is your talent, your ability, your gifting, your workplace. Your workplace is your mission space. Your workplace is the place God has given you to be a light in darkness and be a light with lightness. There's people there who are full of light and there are people there who need the light and you are that light. That we leverage our relationships at work for goodness, not selfishness. The third area, our tears. This is important. This is important, y'all. Everybody say this. My tears are an investment. I was about 30 years old when I discovered my problem. One of my many. And one of my biggest problems was this. I never used my emotions for anybody but me. Do you know that Jesus never used his emotions for himself? He didn't waste his emotions on himself. He invested them almost wholly in other people. If he cried, he was usually crying for somebody else. When's the last time, I mean, think about it, you cried for somebody else. The Bible says this, that David wrote that Jesus has captured every tear we've ever cried in a bottle. Ooh, that's a cultural teaching we need to dig into later. I imagine in heaven there's a closet with vials of tears. And the Bible says that David wrote that Jesus has written or God has written an account of the tears, and that's what they did when people died. They would have tears and people would cry in a bottle. They'd put it in the, in the tomb and they'd have a list of the people who deposited tears in the tomb. Can you imagine you and I going to heaven and Jesus goes, oh, this is a beautiful room. This is the tears room. And you go, where's mine? And you go over here and you find your tears. That one dude over there, his is a whole department. Because he said he cries a lot. Okay, forget it. But could you imagine going to that room and finding your drawer of tears and you pull it out and it's got all these tears and then it's got a list and it says July 9th. 1965, you cried for yourself. July 7th, you cried for yourself. April 8th, you cried for yourself. It goes line after line, cried for yourself, cried for yourself, cried for yourself, cried for yourself. There has to be a day, church, where we use our emotions and we don't waste them just on ourselves, but we invest them in other people. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We invest our emotions in this world and we start caring. We let our heart be broken for the things that breaks God's heart. And we don't waste our emotions at all. But we sow and invest them so that other people will know you are loved. And not just by God, baby. You're loved by me. It's our turn. Jesus gave his blood, his sweat, and his tears. In fact, the only thing Jesus left on this earth is blood, sweat, and tears. Everything else is gone. The angel said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. Jesus is risen. But when he bled, it hit the ground. When he cried, it hit the ground. It hit the airwaves. When, when he emoted, it hit the airwaves. When he sweat, it hit the airwaves. It hit the ground. If we give all of ourselves to his service, 
we will offer ourselves as living sacrifices that change our community. Pastors, will you grab those crosses for me? I believe God gave me a a vision of what his tears and his blood and his sweat created on earth. We talked about it. They put Jesus on the cross, and Pilate had them affix a sign to the cross. It was written in three languages. Does anybody know what those languages were? Yep, Aramaic. What else? (laughs) Yep, Aramaic is similar to Hebrew. Greek and what? Latin. Latin. Three languages. And here's what it said. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. I believe what Jesus was thirsty for was for us, you and I, to use our blood, sweat, and tears to change the sign. So the sign no longer says Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews in Aramaic, and Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews in Latin, and Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews in Greek. That the sign would read in every language, in every nation, that Jesus of Nazareth is our king. That it would say Jesus of Nazareth, the king of Alan Griffin. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of Winston-Salem. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of Forsyth County. The king of North Carolina. The king of the United States of America. The king of South America. The king of Africa. The king of China. The king of Russia. The king of Britain. Until every tribe and nation of this world, the kingdoms of this world are on that sign. We must change the sign. How do we do it? With blood, with sweat, and with tears. We will change that sign. So it reads in every language of this earth. It reads in every tribe, culture of this earth. It reads out to to nations around the globe and the many nations that are in this country that Jesus of Nazareth is our king. He's my king. He's your king. We can change the sign. In a moment, I'm going to set you free. At the very end of the service, after the blessing that Pastor Heather Wood's going to give you, I'm sorry, Heather Rakes is going to give you, Heather Wood just probably freaked out in the back room just now. She's like, ah! After Pastor Heather Rakes gives you a blessing, what I want you to do is I want you to come up and cut a covenant with God. I have two crosses up here. I have two more in the lobby. And we have markers. I just want you to do something very simple. I want you to come forward, and I want you to touch that cross. And I want you to say this with me. Say this out loud with me. Say, I will obey your thirst. Jesus, and not my own. I know Sprite says obey your thirst, right? That was an old school ad campaign. I used to obey my thirst, y'all. I thirsted for a lot of things, money, fame, fortune, women, all kind of stuff. Don't look at me like that. I didn't, I didn't thirst for men. What did you want me to thirst for? Everybody thirsts for all kinds of stuff, okay? But when we obey that, it gets me in trouble. My wife will kill a brother. She'll come at me with a machete like, ay, 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 ay. it'll be crazy. I've learned that if I just obey my thirst and the things I want, the the sinful desires of my heart, the sin will get me in trouble, y'all. But when I obey his thirst, everything gets better. My blood, my sweat, and my tears are not just so they'll be okay or they'll be blessing on the way. My blood, my sweat, and my tears is making a way for somebody else. Somebody else's kid. Somebody else's husband. Somebody else's family. So that they can know Jesus. So somebody else has hope. So somebody else is healed. So in the end, thank you, Toby, for building these crosses. I love you, buddy. Thank you. You're a man of God, and I'm proud to be your pastor and your, and your boss. 
and your dog is my friend. I love Dozier. I'm going to do a dog blessing on that little pooch so he'll stop shedding on me. It's kind of a selfish blessing, isn't it? I want you to come and I want you to touch the cross and I want you to say, I'll obey your thirst, Jesus, instead of my own. You might even want to say this, I'll obey your thirst, Jesus, I'll carry my cross. That's good. If any man or woman would follow Jesus, he or she must first take up their cross, deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Jesus. Don't be trying to walk out of here with my cross. I will tackle you. And when you, when you touch that cross and you say those words, take that pen and write your name on there. Sign your name on there. Sign your name across this cross. Okay? Sign that covenant. Then I'm going to change that sign. I'm going to, with my life, make sure that people know Jesus. They know the love of Jesus. They know the hope there is in Jesus. That is my life. Can I pray for you? With your head up and your eyes open. Maybe you're here right now and you're thinking, Alan, I want a relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you pray for me that my relationship with Jesus would begin? If that's you, you're in the right place. When I count to three, all I want you to do is stand to your feet. If that's you in this room, you're like, man, everybody's going to look at me. I know, right? This is the best. It's the beginning of an, an incredible relationship that we all have in Jesus. But here's my favorite part. You're not going to stand alone because we're going to stand with you. But I want you to go first. You're like, man, I want a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want a relationship with Jesus. I'm willing to restart it if I let it fail. And I want it to start if I've never had one. I want to know Jesus. And, man, when I die, I want to be with him. People go, I want to go to heaven. I don't care about heaven. I want to go wherever Jesus is. That's heaven. So if you want Jesus, you're in the right place. When I count to three, I want you to stand on your feet. Are you ready? This is going to be good. Look at your neighbor right now and say, don't be scared. Look at your neighbor and say, be stirred up. Ready? One, two, three. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. This is awesome. Stand up, stand up. Oh, yeah. Family, I love you. Family, I love you. You're my family. I love you. Stand up. I love you. Oh, yeah. I love you. We're family. Stay standing. I love you. I love you. I, lo I love you guys sitting down too, but they're awesome. I love you. Now, everybody, stand up with them. Stand up with them. Take your right hand. Put it over your heart. I want you to say a precious prayer with me. This time, I know I have you talk loud a lot. I want you to whisper this prayer, okay? Say this with me. Say, hey, Jesus, I need you to forgive me of my sin. I give my life to you now and forever in Jesus name I'm yours forever now father I pray for my brothers and my sisters in this room that Lord you would give us the courage to walk by faith that we as we move forward in faith we would invest our blood our sweat and our tears God that we would not hold back on the gospel that we wouldn't be intimidated or afraid to tell people about the love of God that Lord this going into Easter we would prepare to reach people and to encourage people in the things of the Lord like never before God being proud of what you did for us on the cross oh we're proud of you Jesus we're bold about you Jesus make us bolder make us more powerful Give us the power of the Holy Spirit to sustain us. And Lord, I pray that your blessing would crown their head. In Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. amen. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. One more time, say amen. amen. Now give the Lord the biggest ovation of the morning. Hallelujah. By the way, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to meet you in the coffee shop. I'm going to hug your neck, and I'm going to look you in the eyeball and tell you I love you. You're my family. I'll see you out there. Awesome. Well, good morning again. It is my joy. You can have a seat. Let me do this. Let me let you sit. Go ahead. 
It's my joy this morning to get to receive your missions monthly gift today. Um, as Pastor mentioned earlier, we have our missionaries here with us, but this is the Penley family. Ashley and his wife, Meredith. Meredith, you may know her dad is Reverend Brian Rainbow. He was on staff here for a long time, many years ago. But Ashley and Meredith and their children, Aiden, who's 17, Riley, who's 13, and Amelia, who's 12, are with them. And they're missionaries to the country of Ecuador, and they've been there nearly 12 years. Can we say thank you to the Lord for their hard work? They have been faithful to that country. But they have three main focuses there right now, the first of which is Chi Alpha. So they receive university students from all over, and a group that started with four students has grown to over 100 students, even in the midst of COVID. The Lord has been faithful, and there has been salvation after salvation after salvation, praise the Lord. Their second focus there is the Church Planters School. So university students are able to come and receive their credentialing from the Assemblies of God through Global Studies University. Is that not amazing? And their third focus is church planting. They are focused right now on reaching people groups that have not yet been reached for Jesus, the Quechua Indians and the Afro-Ecuadorians. And together, those groups combined number over 600,000 unreached people in the country of Ecuador. Ushers, would you go ahead and come forward, and as you all prepare your gift, I want you to go ahead and pull out your cell phone. It's the easiest way to give. If you have yet to do this, please try it today. All you have to do is text the number that's going to be on the screen, the amount you would like to give, followed by the keyword missions, and every single dollar goes straight to our missionaries. So if you pull that out and you text me, you might go, oh, I don't want to get text messages all week from this number. You will not. You will get one text back and it's a receipt. Hallelujah. So pull out that text your gift along with the keyword missions. You know, as Pastor said earlier, Jesus says at the end of Matthew, he says, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Can I remind you something about your generosity today? Your generosity, your giving, has the ability to take the gospel to places that your feet never will. It has the ability to go into countries. I may never get the chance to go to Ecuador. I hope I do. I hope you invite me. Hint, hint, wink, wink. But if we never get to go, your generosity right now in this moment is going to reach people that have yet to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So I don't only want you to be generous in your giving. Ushers, if you would go ahead and receive the gifts. I don't just want you to be generous with your giving this morning. Uh, we've already been generous with our gratitude, and we have thanked them for their work. I want us to also be generous this morning in our prayer. Would you guys stand for just a moment, the Penley family? They're here stateside right now because in September of last year, Ashley was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. And he's undergone treatment and he's recently finished his final round of chemo. Amen. And I don't cry because I'm sad. I cry because I'm so grateful for you guys. But we are believing Ashley has a scan coming up on April 20th. And we're gonna believe today as a church that that scan is gonna be 100% clear. There's not gonna be a single lit up cell on that scan. And there's a few more medical things that they have to get checked off, but let me tell you, this family, even their kids, are hungry to get back to the people of Ecuador. So would you pray for them? And how many of you guys know, because you've been through some stuff, that when it rains, it pours, and in this household, it feels like monsoon season? because while Ashley's been here getting treatment, Meredith had to have her thyroid completely removed and they've gone through trial after trial after trial. And I know that it's because when you start to reach into unreached people groups for the Lord, the devil wants to push back as hard as he can. But today as a church and as a family, we're gonna surround them 
and our prayer is going to push back the hand of the enemy against them. So would you stand up onto your feet right now, and would you just reach a hand their direction? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray total and complete healing over Ashley's body. I pray, Lord God, for that sand that is coming on April 20th. God, I pray that you would surprise him. I pray that you would surprise Meredith. I pray that you would surprise their family. God, I pray that you would surprise the doctors, Lord, that there would be not one cell lit up on that stand, that there would be not one cell that is not in alignment with the word of God. I speak healing over his body. I speak wholeness over his body, Lord God. And I speak it over Meredith, Lord, as she recovers from her surgery. I pray for a strength from the hand of God, Lord, that she hasn't felt before. I pray for a peace to overwhelm them and to surround them on every side. Lord God, I pray for complete healing of their bodies, their minds, and their spirits, Lord. I pray over their children, God, that you would give them a joy that comes from the strength of the Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that you would prepare them and equip them and give them everything that they need to be able to get back to the people of Ecuador and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. We ask all of these things, God. I pray for the people of Ecuador. I pray for the Quechua Indians, and I pray for the Afro-Ecuadorians, Lord God, that you would prepare their hearts, God, that you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear, and I pray that the hearts of those people would be fertile soil, God, for the word of the Lord that is going to come from this family and from the ministries that they have down there, and God, from person after person that they have poured their life out on and into, God, that you would use every single one of them to reach the people of Ecuador. God, I pray it in the name of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, do one more thing for me, will you? You know, to get a gift, you kind of have to have your hands out like this. So will you go ahead and raise, lift your hands up, raise them up like this? The last gift that Jesus left his disciples with was peace. I just believe that the Lord wants to surround you with peace this morning. Whatever you're walking through, receive his peace. I pray that the peace of God that surpasses every understanding would guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. Before you go, don't you walk out those doors. Make sure that you come to one of these crosses. There's one here, there's one here, there's two in the lobby. And would you sign your name here and make that connection, that commitment with Jesus. Pour your life out. We will pour our lives out as living sacrifices for the Lord. Come and sign before you leave. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next week.